Um, of course, today we are in a really very different context to what we were uh, at the time this access regulation uh, came about. Since then, we've had a whole host of important institutional facts within the European Union, the Lisbon Treaty, we've had uh, the economic crisis, we've had um, the, the GDPR, uh, um, a major piece of, of parallel legislation really, uh, Brexit, which we certainly were not expecting or anticipating ever in the past decades, really. And um, of course, most recently at the pandemic, the pandemic. But, you know, um, and, the, and the change context is also the uh, hugely uh, digital dimension, the very different digital dimension that exists today that certainly wasn't there 30 years ago, but even 20 years ago was a very different one um, to what we're um, facing uh, today. But the fact is that um, this is also, I think, um, a fitting moment to, um, to look forward, to both look back, learning from the past, but also looking forward, grounded, as it were, in the here and now, uh, at the time of this uh, new convention on the future of Europe that has been that has been launched. So today we're going to look also at the challenges, um, both within the institutions, and we're starting um, with two wonderful uh, panelists from within uh, the European Parliament at the time the regulation was adopted, within the council, a very important player, within the courts, uh, and for that we have a lawyer who's pleaded many of the cases, and within NGOs. So. We don't cover everybody and every possible, but we do um, cover a fair, um, a fair range of it. So if I could just say um, maybe two brief comments and then I'll hand the floor over to the panel, panelists. From a research perspective, um, so looking at it in a sense from the outside, and also in terms of accountability, public accountability, because access to documents is, is obviously grounded in a more general sense, a more general democratic perspective. And the idea that uh, we need information, also public information in order to be able to hold actors to account. What I observe is that, um, it, I think in particular over the past decade, but maybe slightly longer, there are what I call loops of accountability, you know, where, um, where issues follow on from one another. You know, there may be court cases that are then the same issue taken up by the European Ombudsman. They may be brought by parliamentarians to the courts or to the Ombudsman. The om Ombudsman may investigate deeply. So there are multiple actors involved um, at the same time. We saw that. Uh, we've seen that around the trialogues issues and we've seen it around, you know, uh, issues such as uh, rather technical issues such as glyphosate and, and that whole saga, both within cases and um, parliament. But also we've seen evolution in terms of the actors that in, are involved. So it's not any longer just the, of course, the original uh, legislative actors but also includes today many of the agencies. And, um, and some of those agencies actually are, you know, iteratively, iteratively involved in court cases like the European Medicines Agency, for example, but then also mm -hmm. under scrutiny by the European Ombudsman, but then themselves adopt a very proactive stance, which is actually what has happened. Um, with regard to the European Medicines Agency during the pandemic, um, that they very proactively um, have themselves gone much further than, than previously in terms of transparency. Um, and the other only issue that I would like to flag is, because I think it's an issue that is often under, um, understudied, is the issue of the register of documents. You know, that seems quite a technical uh, and it also involves quite a bit of study to sort of see uh, whether they're up to scratch and what they include and don't include and whatever. Um, but there it's been interesting to observe that the European Ombudsman has been quite active on that front. You know, that's not something that can be easily challenged before the court because it's, you can't generically 
um, easily challenge a register of documents, whereas the European Ombudsman can uh, investigate and has done so actually in some uh, uh, interesting recommendations, both for Frontex and Europol. So the sort of outer reaches of European governance uh, can be covered in that way. All right, well, they were just a few introductory um, remarks. And uh, I think without further ado, I'm very happy to, um, to introduce the first speaker uh, from the panel today, Sir Graham Wat Watson. He, has, uh, he was a former Libe chairman of the European Parliament and he was there and very much involved uh, at the time that the access uh, regulation was negotiated and, and is fully aware um, and, and no doubt will tell us about that, the context in which that happened. Um, so I'm very grateful that you've joined us today and um, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, I'd like to thank the Centre for Judicial Cooperation for organising this and to congratulate Deirdre Curtin and Emilio de Capitani on getting us all together. I think this is very worthwhile to look back at the history of a piece of legislation that's been quite significant in the development of the European Union. When I look back at the 18 months really in which we crafted this legislation, I think what strikes me most is how we were all caught up in this atmosphere of opportunity. You know, Bill Clinton had been elected in the United States. Tony Blair had been elected in the UK. Gerhard Schröder had replaced Helmut Kohl in Germany. Romano Prodi had succeeded the rather dire Jacques Santerre as president of the commission. And there was a sense that we were entering a new global era in a new millennium. And there was an idea that we could make it work, that we could really improve uh, lives of European Union citizens, which I think we were all swept up in. The Treaty of Amsterdam had offered us new opportunities. It was turning the European Union from what was still essentially a European economic community into a community of values. And that was tested in February of 2000, when the Freedom Party, a far-right party, was elected into government in Austria, and the European Union responded three months later by opening the new European Union Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia in Vienna. It was a new millennium. We had a Portuguese presidency which succeeded a rather lackluster Finnish presidency of the Union. And a justice minister in Portugal, a man, uh, Antonio Costa, who has moved on to much higher office uh, subsequently, and a Portuguese commissioner in Antonio Vitorino, who had been part of the generation that had forced Salazar out of office, who were committed to proper functioning democratic structures. And when on the 26th of January 2000, Romano Prodi launched the Commission's Freedom of Information proposals, he met with a council presidency that was very willing to take them forward. I recall that in March of that year, for the first time ever, the presidency invited the chairman of the Justice and Home Affairs Committee a post which I was honoured to occupy, to attend a meeting of the Justice and Home Affairs Ministers in Lisbon. And we started this debate. And as many of you will recall, we had a rather difficult six months from July to December of that year under a French presidency uh, of President uh, Chirac. Uh, there was a ministerial reshuffle of his Justice and Home Affairs Ministers halfway through his presidency. He ended it by dismissing Romano Prodi at the Nice summit as a petty bureaucrat. Um, things didn't look good. Nonetheless, on the 18th of September, we managed to organize in Parliament a hearing of the Justice and Home Affairs Committee on Article 255. And in November, 
the chairpersons of the four parliamentary committees which had an interest, which were the Constitutional Affairs Committee, the Legal Affairs Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, and Justice and Home Affairs, met uh, Pierre de Boissieu, who was then the French permanent representative, to discuss how we could take the dossier forward. Now, Pierre de Boissieu, fortunately, was a good pro-European. He later became the General Secretary of the Council, but he was having to work under a rather difficult Jacques Chirac, who didn't really see this as a priority dossier. But he recognized that there were only three legislatures in the whole world which made their laws entirely in secret. It was Pyongyang in North Korea, Havana in Cuba, and the Council of Ministers in Brussels. And he accepted that we had appointed in Michael Cashman from the Socialists and Hanya Maivegan from the Christian Democrats, two extremely well-qualified people to take this dossier forward. I was at something of a disadvantage because I'm not a lawyer, uh, although my wife is. And I was running for the leadership of my group in the European Parliament. So I had a few other things on my mind, but I was very fortunate to have in my uh, chief of staff, Emilio de Capitani, uh, who grip grabbed this dossier uh, by the horns and made sure that I did everything I was supposed to do uh, to take it forward. And I recall discussing it over lunch in Stockholm in November of 2000 with Juran Persson, who had become the Swedish Prime Minister, fairly progressive Swedish Prime Minister, and pressing him about the importance of taking this dossier through. I'm not sure he was convinced, but there were two people there who were. One was Anna Lindt, his Foreign Secretary, and the other was Gunnar Lund, the Swedish permanent representative. And when in January of 2001, uh, Michael and Hanya and I went along, in fact, we hosted the first trilogue, Parliament hosted it, uh, with Gunnar Lund, with Bernhard Scepter, the Deputy Secretary General of the Commission, we were able to start a discussion uh, under uh, a a welcoming presidency uh, with the Commission and the Council about how we could take it forward. Uh, on the 10th of February, the Justice and Home Affairs Council met in the City Hall in Stockholm. I remember it well. Thomas Budström, a former professional footballer, was their Justice Minister. And they greeted us in a room which had in the centre some large trays with four huge blocks of ice brought down from the north of Sweden uh, to serve as a decoration. We all looked around for some very large glasses of gin and tonic to put them in. Um, we didn't find them, uh, unfortunately. Um, but we managed to have a discussion at that council about what to do. And none of this got into the media. The media was dominated by reports of this discussions on asylum and immigration, and in particular by Otto Schilly, uh, wanting to take a hard line uh, against immigration uh, as the German Home Affairs Minister. But behind the scenes, a lot of work took place on this dossier. And we took it forward in April at a lunch in Strasbourg uh, with Anna Lindt and Romano Prodi and Nicole Fontaine, uh, where we discussed what the chances were of the Swedish presidency actually getting it through. There was a lot of work in the subsequent weeks with Corapair, and I recall striking the final agreement on what I think must have been Easter Sunday. Uh, it was the 22nd of April. Gunnar Lund uh, was lying outside a hotel in Egypt, and I was on a small sailing boat in the English Channel uh, in a force five wind. Uh, but we managed to sort out the final details uh, on mobile phone technology, uh, nonetheless. And on the 25th of April, uh, the Parliamentary Committee and Corapair and the Commission uh, adopted it. The Commission, I think, had to have a vote. 
because some of the commissioners were worried that documents on infringement proceedings against member states might be included in this legislation and they did not wish them to be. Uh, anyway, matters were sorted out and on the 3rd of May, uh, we adopted it in Parliament uh, at plenary, thanks to the excellent work uh, that Michael and Hanya had carried out. What had we achieved? Well, we'd achieved a public register of documents in each institution and a commitment to an annual report detailing how many cases there had been of documents not being made available. We had achieved a situation where legally all documents had to be available unless their publication would undermine the public interest. And we had achieved a public commitment from each institution to develop a culture of openness. I think one might question how far that has gone in some of the institutions, but anyway, there was a commitment at the time. I was a little stung, as I guess Michael might have been too, by the criticisms made by State Watch uh, of what we had achieved. I think the wonderful Tony Bunyan, who retired after 30 very productive years, uh, only quite recently, had in, in typical fashion gone rather over the top. But I'm pleased to say that most of the other commentary at the time was favorable. And I certainly feel that we achieved quite a lot with that piece of legislation. Thank you very much, um, Sir Watson. Thank you very much for that. I think that's a, a wonderful kicking off point um, for all of us. And also good to remember uh, the novelty um, of what was contained in it and the very important elements um, in terms of, um, in a sense, the burden of proof, but also for me, the more structural ele elements such as the register and the obligation to, for institutions to produce annual reports, actually documenting what they, what they had done is, is really important. I think without further ado, I'm now going to hand over um, to the one of the co-rapporteurs at that time, um, Member of Parliament, um, um, Michael Cashman, um, who really steered the whole thing through and uh, was responsible also for much of the content. So, Michael, you have the floor. Thank you. Deirdre, thank you very much. And, and could I ask you to perhaps uh, interject when I've got te uh, two minutes left? Uh, that would help me. Um, First of all, congratulations to, to uh, Sir Graham on uh, laying out uh, part of the history, and I'm going to be dealing with some of the same because uh, I've entitled this Looking Back in Order to Move Forward. And I'm going to begin with a quote. Somebody might recognise it. Asking for transparency in a public organisation where most of the members are bureaucrats, diplomats and politicians has always been a challenge because each one of these categories will try to preserve and expand its power without being held accountable to anyone. Yes, you guessed it, Emilio de Capitani, uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more of, in that vein from him later. But I have to say on reflection that such a description could be describing the government of Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom, which having argued for greater sovereign powers by endorsing Brexit, is now taking every opportunity not to be accountable to its parliament, let alone the people and the courts. And what a strange uh, change of attitude compared to the UK's position, a pivotal position on Regulation 1049-2001 during its passage through Parliament and Council, when the UK and others played a key role in preventing the Council of 15 member states from adopting a negative position on access to documents. The UK, along with Ireland, Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, Finland, formed a blocking minority. Uh, and indeed, we met uh, in London, uh, the rapporteur and members of the committee in order to share opinions. So from, because from the very beginning, it was clear to me and to others that there was deep opposition to a wide ranging public access to documents from both within the council and the commission. Indeed, it was also evident in parliament 
where member state governments started to exert pressure. Arguably, I think, without the date of May 2001 contained within the treaty, we might never have adopted a regulation if it wasn't for that legal obligation. As I said, there, and as uh, Sir Graham has also referred to, there was opposition within the parliament and within the European political parties. Some member states were deeply suspicious of transparency and said so loudly, including Spain, Italy, Germany and France amongst them. They lobbied their MPs, resulting in fact a mythology swirling into a dramatic tapestry as politicians were told their personal medical data would be released and made available and indeed their financial information too. Other MEPs were told that their superior legislation, such as in Denmark, Sweden and Finland, would be downgraded and diminished. There was also fierce competition, uh, as Sir Graham said, in the Parliament as to which committee should be the lead committee. And good sense prevailed and the Justice, Home Affairs and Citizens Freedoms Libe uh, became the lead committee and we adopted what was called the Hughes Procedure. Uh, and under the guidance of the head of the Libe Secretariat, Emilio de Capitani and Sir Graham, we began heightened collaboration with that Constitutional Affairs Committee. And it was intensive work, but it was, we were fortunate in, in that um, the, uh, the lead rapporteur for the Constitutional Affairs Committee and I actually got on personally, and that helped get through uh, the politics. Uh, we, we worked within our committees and set up informal working groups in order to adopt a cross-party working document in advance of our amendments and votes in committee. Again, it was essential because of the mythology that was spreading outside to bring people in. Um, but central to the success of the working party uh, and to eradicate the myths uh, and to gain widespread, uh, widespread support was the Constitutional Affairs Rapporteur, uh, Hanya Maivaken, a highly respected Dutch member of the European Parliament and a member of the European People's Party. The Christian Democrats and this was an important signal to the uh, European uh, Christian Democrats. Those, some of them remained doubt, doubtful. Uh, Mrs. Maivecken and other pro-transparency MEPs managed to keep the EPP together and that was extremely important when we were heading towards the final vote. A point of interest for me at the time was that the Greens felt they could not support us because our ambitions didn't go far enough. Nonetheless, uh, led by Heidi Hautela, they remained committed and engaged, and I un understood the, the dilemma that they faced. Nonetheless, we continued, and after votes in the respective committees on a full range of compromise amendments, the report was adopted in plenary with a substantial majority, and the trialogues, as Sir Graham said, began. They were difficult, they were frank, they were honest, and there was a lot of tension, especially within council, but agreement was reached under the Swedish presidency and the regulation signed into force. I stood there grinning like an idiot watching them signing it on the 5th of May 2001. And from my recollection, I think key to the success were a number of articles, particularly Article 4 and Article 9, but they were also contentious. Article 9, of course, on the treatment of sensitive documents and Article 4 uh, on the exceptions. Article 5, I believe, uh, was crucial because it dealt with the issue of where superior rights of access were in play in member states' legislation and where documents were held, held in that member state. The article, therefore, calls on member states not to jeopardise the attainments of the regulation and allows the member state, very clever this, to refer the request to the Commission. As I said, this was a neat triangulation that in my opinion reassured those member states with a superior national right of access to documents. However, in order to reach agreement with the Council and Commission, we had given in to the principle in Article 4 of protecting the decision-making process, which the Council and the Commission would hang on to eternally as an excuse not to release a document. Uh, for the most part, I believe the regulation functioned well, uh, but it was clear, especially in the light of jurisprudence, that it needed revision. 
certainly in relation to the provisions contained within the Treaty of Lisbon on the functioning of the European Union. It was obvious to most people that we had, had to bring citizens closer to the Union, or perhaps more appropriately, we had to bring the body of the EU closer to its heart, the citizens. I won't go into the detail of the Lisbon Treaty. I'm sure that will be dealt with by others in relation to the regulation. I will instead focus on the changed political landscape within the European Parliament. So now that we had Lisbon and Article 15 uh, of that treaty, we had the opportunity to address the prohibitive issue of not, quote, undermining the institution's decision-making process. Indeed, I believe the Lisbon Treaty had signaled its death knell when it introduced the concept of citizenship and participative democracy, as Deirdre Curtin referred to earlier. You have to know what is going on, what is being debated and what the positions are in council, as well as the European Parliament, if you are going to be able to participate in the democratic process. Therefore, it was no longer acceptable for the council to deliberate and vote in secret. As a fully fledged co-legislator, the European Parliament had always carried out its work with notable exceptions in the public domain. It was time for the council to do the same. Indeed, the main rule for participative democracy is Article 15 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, whose opening words are, in order to promote good governance and ensure the participation of civil society, the union's institutions, bodies and offices and agencies shall conduct their work as openly as possible. This obligation is clearly linked to Article 41, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which promotes the principle of good, in, good administration inside the EU. With these principles in mind, in December 2011, the European Parliament eventually, after a very difficult period, adopted its position on the recasting or revision of Regulation 1049-2001. As far as legislative procedures were concerned, the European Parliament decided to delete the reference in Article 4 to the efficiency of the decision-making process for the, for the legislative procedures. It adopted a wide and progressive approach to the opening up of democracy democracy as foreseen in the Lisbon Treaty, but we faced fierce resistance from both within Parliament and from the other institutions. I'm coming to my close and I will say that it was clear that the Council and the Commission were strongly against the position adopted by the Parliament. This was seen in the vehement opposition of the European People's Party, misled by some of their MEPs, coordinators, and sadly, commission officials who worked the corridors spreading the mythology. The debate, I believe, is worth reading for some notably outlandish speeches and the blatant misrepresentation of the intended revision. Indeed, it was denounced as a danger to democracy, a danger to the rule of law, and would aid terrorism. And once again, the oft repeated lie that the personal data of MEPs would be accessible. Thankfully, the opposition failed in their attempt and we again achieved a substantial majority when it was finally adopted. However, trialogues made very little progress with the Commission and the Council, despite positive engagement from the Danish presidency. And as we all know, negotiations ground to a halt. The revision, the recast position, still rests with Council awaiting further discussion, like other so-called difficult dossiers. My friends, I believe this deadlock must be broken and there must be a change of attitude from the Council and the Commission. Because if we do not show how the EU functions as a democracy, then it can so easily be misrepresented and thereby the road leads to voter disillusionment and exits from the UK like Brexit, which believe me, as an English subject, no longer a citizen, serves no one. If we are truly pro-European and we believe in the union, then we should, should be proud of how the institutions work together and how in the spirit, spirit of productive compromise, we serve our citizens. 
as pro-Europeans, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain from transparency. Thank you, Michael, for those um, stirring words and also um, for a fascinating account, I think for many people listening in who won't be aware um, of, of how that went or indeed also the sad fate of the, of the recast, uh, the, re the revised regulation, um, which indeed seems to be assigned to um, a kind of purgatory, if you like, um, with um, no clear sign of resuscitation. So um, maybe that's something that needs to be, to be thought about again. Um, I'm now handing over to um, Professor Jean-Paul Jacquet, who was the legal advisor of the council for many years. I certainly don't want to put you in the position of having to defend. I didn't deliberately set it up um, like that, but we first had the parliament's input and now um, the council and Professor Jacquet um, has a lot to tell us, I, I think, on, on how it has been over the years also post adoption perhaps or within the council but in any event that is uh, entirely up to you i'm extremely glad and grateful that you could join us this afternoon thank you very much you have the merci floor beaucoup. merci beaucoup merci de m'avoir invité je vais pas de révéler de secret parce que mes les deux orateurs qui m'ont précédé ont déjà largement parlé du développement de l'affaire Mais je voudrais simplement préciser d'abord que la négociation du règlement n'a pas été pour le Conseil une chose nouvelle. Comme vous le savez tous, euh, sur la base de la déclaration de Maastricht, nous avions élaboré avec la Commission un code de conduite sur l'accès aux documents et ce code de conduite a donné lieu à la rédaction d'un code d'accès adopté sur la base du règlement intérieur du Conseil, un code d'accès qui avait d'ailleurs fait l'objet d'un recours devant la Cour de justice par les Pays-Bas qui estimaient que le Conseil ne pouvait pas se fonder sur son pouvoir d'adopter un règlement intérieur pour adopter un mode d'accès euh, aux documents. Mais cela veut dire que Au moment où est arrivée, après le traité d'Amsterdam, la discussion sur l'accès aux documents, les positions du Conseil étaient depuis longtemps formalisées dans cet ajout à son règlement intérieur et qu'il n'y avait plus de discussion interne. Le code d'accès qui avait été élaboré, il avait été élaboré sous la pression des États les plus favorables à l'accès, notamment les États nordiques, le Royaume-Uni, l'Irlande, et les débats qui étaient penchés. Je pense que ce que voulait éviter le Conseil, c'est que l'on porte atteinte à trois points fondamentaux sur lesquels il s'entendait d'ailleurs très largement avec la Commission. Le premier de ces points, peut-être le moins important aujourd'hui, c'était d'éviter que le règlement ne soit contourné par certains États membres qui avaient des dispositions plus généreuses relatives à l'accès, notamment les États nordiques, où la nécessité de maintenir une procédure selon laquelle un État ne pouvait pas donner libéralement les documents euh, des institutions et notamment les documents du Conseil sans une collaboration avec l'institution elle-même. La Cour de justice a un peu détruit cette ligne de défense, comme toutes les autres d'ailleurs. Le deuxième point qui était fondamental, c'était la préservation des avis juridiques. Effectivement, on a toujours craint et on craint toujours que la publication des avis juridiques ne suscite un contentieux. Il arrive souvent que les services juridiques des institutions ne soient pas d'accord avec les institutions elles-mêmes et l'écrivent. Et à partir du moment où le document est publié, 
si le Conseil ou la Commission a adopté une position différente, les avis juridiques fournissent un appui utile pour le contentieux. C'était ce qu'on voulait éviter. De la même manière, pour la Commission, et c'est dans le même cas que ça se situe, les procédures et les documents relatifs aux procédures qu'elle poursuit, notamment les procédures de manquement et les procédures contentieuses également. Rendre public ces mémoires peut conduire à des pressions de la part des États membres, de la part du public, et ce n'était pas tellement souhaité. Enfin, le dernier élément, c'est de préserver le secret ou le bon fonctionnement des délibérations, préserver la capacité opérationnelle en évitant des pressions indues pendant les délibérations. Vous devez comprendre que vu son mode de fonctionnement, un peu comme une enceinte diplomatique, les États membres ne souhaitent pas du tout, et n'ont jamais souhaité, que les positions qu'elles puissent adopter en cours de délibération soient rendues publiques au cours de ces délibérations, parce que dans la mesure où elles sont appelées à en changer, ces changements de position successifs les exposent à des critiques internes. Donc c'était les trois points à préserver, je crois que sur ces trois points, sans grande difficulté, dans l'ensemble, on a obtenu un équilibre qui était un équilibre relativement satisfaisant. Bien entendu, la jurisprudence de la Cour a affaibli considérablement ses protections. L'arrêt turco a limité la protection des avis juridiques, bien que récemment, dans un arrêt sur les avis juridiques relatifs à la procédure d'arbitrage dans les accords relatifs aux investissements, la Cour de justice a confirmé la préservation des avis juridiques lorsqu'ils portaient sur des questions systémiques qui pouvaient avoir une grande incidence sur les relations extérieures. Donc, c'est une ouverture qui est une ouverture euh, mitigée. Euh, sur la protection des délibérations, je pense qu'Emilio en dira plus que moi, puisqu'il est le grand vainqueur euh, en ce qui concerne la publicité euh, des euh, trilogues. On est arrivé à un système où les délibérations sont plus ouvertes grâce à la Cour de justice. Ce qui m'apparaît frappant aussi, c'est combien cette jurisprudence s'est étendue aux agences. Vous évoquez l'agence du médicament, toute la jurisprudence récente sur les études préparatoires pour les médicaments marque une ouverture considérable. Il n'y a qu'un point sur lequel la Cour semble une, soit d'une timidité ou d'une fermeté, je ne sais pas, extraordinaire, c'est sur la Banque centrale européenne. Systématiquement, elle évoque le régime spécifique de la Banque centrale européenne et bloque tout accès aux délibérations de la Banque centrale, refusant de leur appliquer le règlement au profit de la décision des gouverneurs qui établit un secret quasi absolu. Là, on est vraiment dans une boîte noire. Et ce que je voudrais dire, c'est peut-être ma considération principale, c'est que Malheureusement, on ne règle pas le problème de la transparence uniquement par le droit et par des textes juridiques. Ce que j'ai constaté, c'est que plus la transparence était grande, plus le processus de, de décision se réfugiait en amont, en amont dans des endroits où la transparence n'entre pas. Dans l'arrêt de Capitani, ce qui m'a frappé, c'est que les institutions évoquant la nécessité de disposer d'un espace de réflexion, la Cour de justice dit, bon, la Cour, le tribunal dit, bon, les trilogues, ce n'est pas grave, ça part du processus législatif, mais vous avez toujours un espace de réflexion parce que vous vous rencontrez en dehors du processus législatif. Alors finalement, le cœur magique, de la décision, l'endroit où on prend la décision, 
tentent à sortir des procédures pour se réfugier dans des systèmes et dans des discussions de plus en plus informelles. Si bien que le processus institutionnel de prise de décision devient un simple théâtre où l'on répète des décisions que des prises ailleurs, en secret, dans des négociations. Donc, plus on poursuit la transparence, plus on provoque les institutions à se réfugier en dehors du système normal, ce qui pose un problème, parce que le système normal est régi par des règles institutionnelles précises et capable d'être contrôlé par la Cour de justice. Si vous décidez en dehors, il n'y a plus de contrôle et il n'y a plus de garantie. Euh, je prends l'exemple qui, qui m'a toujours intéressé. Lorsque j'étais au Conseil, sur les documents, on inscrivait toujours en footnote la position des États membres. Et quand les documents étaient publiés, tout le monde connaissait la position des États membres. À partir du moment où on a commencé à travailler dans l'espace de liberté, de sécurité et de justice, soudainement les positions des États membres ont disparu. Il a été donné instruction de ne plus inscrire les positions des États membres. Suite aux, à l'œuvre du médiateur et aux protestations, la pratique s'est à nouveau développé, mais euh, on cherche toujours, on recherche toujours le maximum de secrets. J'ai un autre exemple, mais qui ne porte pas sur les documents qui portent sur les délibérations. Je pense que vous avez tous été frappés par le fait que les délibérations du Conseil sont publiques, mais qu'aucune décision n'est réellement prise au sein du Conseil lui-même. Euh, au cours de la réunion du Conseil, les États membres exposent publiquement leur position d'une manière très convenue et très prudente. La présidente dit ensuite, « Bien, euh, chers collègues, euh, il est temps d'aller déjeuner. » La décision et le débat réel se développent au cours du déjeuner. Et quand on rentre, le président du Conseil dit, « Nous avons trouvé un accord. » Donc, plus vous voulez que la délibération soit publique, plus elle se réfugie ailleurs. Et c'est ça le challenge du système. Je crois véritablement qu'il y a un moment où la décision est prise, on a peut-être nécessaire besoin d'un minimum de confidentialité, euh, mais euh, cela va totalement à l'encontre de la transparence. D'autre part, et je conclurai là-dessus, euh, l'accès aux documents est un accès a posteriori. Et finalement, il n'intéresse, si on constate, je lis les rapports du Conseil sur la transparence, si on s'intéresse à savoir quels sont les gens qui demandent un accès aux documents, à la, plus forte, la plus forte proportion, ce sont nos collègues, bien entendu, les, pour les thèses, les articles, etc. Ensuite viennent les avocats, et on sait bien pourquoi, Ensuite viennent euh, d'autres, les, les lobbyistes, le plus souvent. Et euh, je n'ai jamais vu ou rarement vu un journaliste qui en ait besoin pour une enquête de fond. L'information, on la trouve ailleurs. Donc, le véritable enjeu de la transparence, ce n'est pas seulement l'accès aux documents, c'est d'assurer la réalité du caractère public des délibérations pour que le public puisse instantanément avoir le, une révélation du contenu de celle-ci et pour que la presse puisse en rendre compte autrement que par des confidences de couloir données par des délégations. Donc là, nous avons un challenge, nous avons un challenge, nous avons à, à rechercher un moyen d'avoir non pas une transparence a posteriori, parce que quand on obtient tout plusieurs mois après, ça n'a plus grand intérêt, mais une transparence en temps réel. Merci. Thank you. Euh, merci beaucoup pour, ce, pour ces mots très intéressants qui soulignent quelques points euh, fondamentaux pour la discussion. 
Uh, and now I will continue um, in English also for the sake of some of the researchers. So I just very briefly would like to just, um, in case someone didn't, didn't follow it in French, but I think you underlined, um, I mean, and obviously this is in a way the, the fundamental role of the Court of Justice um, afterwards um, in you know, um, determining uh, certain key issues around trialogues or the legal opinions um, of the institutions. Um, I think you very rightly um, spoke about the situation with regard to the European um, Central Bank um, and, and, and the way in which that has been um, maintained. And I would just pick up um, perhaps two other points that you made. Um, um, and, and in a sense, the more transparency one has, um, the more recourse that there will be to secrecy elsewhere, but you know, in the corridors or um, that we'll have empty archives. These are the, um, has always been um, the sort of balance, and you gave a very interesting example about member states' opinion uh, positions that used to be indeed in the notes, um, um, the minutes, and then were removed for a while uh, with regard to the area of freedom, security, and justice, but then came back um, in. So this is, of course, a, a delicate uh, and, and difficult balance. Um, and I think total transparency is anyway not what, what is needed um, at, at any level. But, um, and your final point was, um, I think, quite, uh, quite a fundamental one that um, public access to documents is a posterior. And so it's after the event. And for whom is it really interesting to get these documents afterwards? Um, and in a sense, if um, I, because the reception broke up a little bit, but I think what you said that the fundamental thing is actually for the public to be able to see um, the nature of, of the public deliberations and for that to be reported in the press or whatever, and at that moment uh, for their um, to be a debate, and I think that's a, a very fundamental reflection. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, maybe this was completely unnecessary for everybody, but um, just in case. Um, so it is now uh, my great pleasure to welcome Helen Darbyshire, uh, who's joining us today um, from Spain. She is the director, the founder and director of um, the Madrid-based NGO Access in Info um, Europe established already in 2006, so uh, a long time ago, and uh, Helen has worked uh, all those years as a human rights activist specializing in the public access to information and the development of open and democratic societies. I'm particularly grateful to Helen for joining us today because she's actually on holidays and she's agreed, um, um, she was enthusiastic about this venture and has very kindly agreed to participate. So warmest thank you, um, Helen, and you have the floor. Well, thank you very much indeed to you, Deirdre. Do you hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. Well, uh, good afternoon to, from, from Spain to everybody. Um, ladies and gentlemen and, and dear friends as well, it's a huge honor to be in this uh, really expert company. And uh, it's actually, I'm on holiday because it's my birthday today. And uh, thank you, <laughs> Michael, I think capping. Um, and I had decided to take after, you know, we've all had a very intense pandemic so far. I decided to take a couple of days off and cut myself off from the world. But then this invitation came in and I found myself unable to say no. So apologies that I'm calling you from a car that's parked by the side of a road as I get to my destination. But as I said, it's a real honor to be here. So I'll be brief. Um, and I just want to make a few points from the perspective of civil society, but also covering things which have already been said about the, it was great to hear from, from Graham and Michael and Jean-Paul about the, the more the sort of history of, of this going back to 2001. And I think that one of the challenges that we have today in 2021 
is because precisely back in 2001, Regulation 1049 was a progressive instrument. There were far fewer access to information laws in the world. I, I haven't done a, an account of the exact number, but my guess would be around sort of 40, 50 compared with the 130 that we have today. A lot of huge amount has happened in the last uh, 20 years. Not only that, but if we just step a bit more broadly for a minute, We've had the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in 2006, recognizing a fundamental right of access to information linked to, that, to freedom of expression. 2009, the European Court of Human Rights, not quite so clearly, but nevertheless following the same lines. 2011, the UN Human Rights Committee saying that this is a fundamental right. Many constitutions, new constitutions, recognizing a fundamental right of access to information. A huge amount both of comparative law and jurisprudence developed in the last 20 years. And what that means is that the standards that we have today, even the minimum standards in the Council of Europe's Convention on Access to Official Documents, which came into force on only the 1st of December, 2020, after a, a sort of 10 or so year period of getting enough ratifications, even those minimum standards are higher standards than what we have in Regulation 1049. For example, with the Council of Europe Convention, uh, which will now, we, we've already got other countries coming in and pledging to sign it. Spain is going to be next and I'm working on France and Italy very hard. Um, those countries are committing to sign a convention where every single exception has a harm and public interest test, which is not the case with Regulation 1049. So we've seen this development, but I fear that we're still living at, within the European institutions, within the Brussels bubble, if to call it that, um, with the idea that Regulation 1049 is a progressive instrument and that Europe's doing pretty well on transparency. And that is something that I find in the work that I do quite difficult to counter. But it is something that I think that we do need to shine a light on. Uh, we, we try to do it when we do campaigns, for example, like the campaign that Access Info has done on the commissioner's expenses, trying to get information which these days is available at the national level in most countries, and yet finding it incredibly difficult to get at the, at the European Union level. Um, to take another case, one of our more problematic cases, and we've heard mention of how the, the GDPR and successive sort of privacy tightening has come in since 2001. Uh, we, have, we have the Passara case, brought by journalists who were able to get information about their members of parliament's expenses at the national level and yet not able to get information about MEPs expenses. That makes the EU look very bad. It's certainly these kinds of examples which become well known don't contribute to um, combating the, the, the criticism of Brussels as being a closed place where deals get done behind closed doors and we've We've heard, I mean, uh, Jean-Paul, you were talking about the, the deals that get done over lunch. Of course, that happens everywhere. The question is, how much information can you have before a decision is taken and how much information can you get after that decision is taken in order to justify? And again, that's the kind of thing that we have difficulty with at the EU level. I think that in the past 20 years, on proactive publication of information, the world has moved significantly, open data. It's interesting to hear other speakers talking about the registers of documents, but not so much about the EU open data portal, where there is, of course, a lot of very good information. I, I, I fear that people, more of the European public goes to the European data portal and most people don't know. Most of, most of the trainings I do are for, uh, to tell people, look at the registers. 
people don't know the registers exist. They don't know how to search them. They don't know how to find things there. They don't understand what it means when you see that a document's listed, but you then actually, it's not, the document itself is not there. And how do you go about requesting it? So it's a slightly outdated, antiquated model of making information available proactively. And I think it's something that really needs uh, looking at. Um, but somebody mentioned that the European Medicines Agency has made a huge effort to be more proactively transparent during the pandemic. That is true. But what my contact with the European Medicines Agency during the pandemic has been to discuss the fact that they refuse to receive requests for information by email. The only way you can request information from the European Medicines Agency is using an online form. You can't even request, they don't even allow requests by post. So you have to fill in that online form with obligatory fields, which they're talking about making non-obligatory, but still about who you are. And they've actually told us that they prioritize uh, the requesters, you know, are they journalists, are they academic researchers, who is it? They, they still are stuck in the paradigm, not of this is a fundamental right, but of who are the requesters and why do you want to know that information? It's not only the European Medicines Agency. If you look at Frontex, which requires an ID, uh, you have to send off a copy of your national ID document, your passport or something to be able for, to, for them to process a request. I'm sorry, can you hear me still? My mother, yes, tried, to call, my mother just tried to call me with that. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was really bad, sorry. Um, I'm trying to be professional here, but it's a challenge. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the European Commission insists on asking for everyone's postal address. They say that it doesn't make a difference at the end of the day, whether or not you're from within uh, uh, the European Union or not. But in fact, the idea that this is a fundamental right and it doesn't matter who you are is still not there yet. And then as a sort of concluding thought, two things. Uh, we did a survey, uh, Access Info did a survey between the 14th and 17th of May. And we asked civil society from around Europe, so not people at the Brussels level, more around Europe, whether they would support reform of Regulation 1049, overwhelming support for reform of 1249 to make do things like simplify the procedures but get a proper balance with privacy to um, mean that you don't have to identify yourself to harmonize all the exceptions we've had mention of the european central bank this afternoon uh, the european central bank has exceptions which are not in uh, which are not in the regulation itself um, regulation 1049 itself is that actually legitimate under the treaties in the Lisbon Treaty, it's true that the right of access to information got promoted to a fundamental right, but we haven't had a proper Lisbonization to harmonize the rules across all EU institutions and bodies. So some of them, for example, uh, will not give you the, the right that you have to specify the format in which you prefer the information, the right to prefer uh, machine readable format. Not all bodies recognize that as part of your right. We have to work on that. So we have to work on the Lisbonization. I think that, you know, Access Info, I, I could have talked a bit more about the Access Info case. And we have Ono here. He may be going to mention it. So I'll leave the glory to him on that one. But, you know, the mere fact that we have to take these cases, that we have to fight these battles, and that we're still struggling to get some of the information that we've already won access to, and that Emilio's had to do his cases, it's not quite how it should be. And we really need to work on changing this paradigm. And then my last thought is, it's not only what really is of interest to many people around Europe is not only information direct from the European institutions, but we have a massive problem of being able to find out about who are the recipients and beneficiaries of the EU funds around Europe. And that is something that Europe doesn't mandate. And we're seeing it once again with the next generation EU funds, our recovery from the pandemic, where every single member state at the national level is creating its own rules about participation and transparency. That, that's, you know, it's not how it should be given that those are funds going through the EU. I think even we could make the case, and I would like to try and put this on the table for people to consider. I think that we can make the case that the EU should regulate minimum standards for member states. 
because this is a rule of law issue. This is an anti-corruption issue. This is a democracy issue. We don't, we have some countries that are doing very well, but some member states that have gone backwards on transparency, including about transparency of spending of EU funds. Um, and, and that becomes actually a threat to the democracy and the in our, our European democracy and the way those funds are used. So it's high time, 20 years, fantastic, well done, but it's high time we really take regulation 1049 and I would say the transparency rules around all 27 EU countries up to the right level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Helen, for that wonderful presentation and for bringing back also a different kind of context um, around all of this and also where this issue has moved on to in the intervening years in other locations. Um, I think what you were saying at the end um, is particularly interesting, the idea of minimum standards for the member states and the EU having a role potentially in that regard. But I mean, that ought to be taken seriously. Also, the EU to do that has to get its own house um, in order with regard to how it, um, how transparent it is and how proactive it is in that, in that process. So in a way, I was thinking the metaphor of the metaphor for today, of where we are, a car parked um, on the side of the <laughs> road. Yes, I am the metaphor, right? <laughs> but hopefully getting to a destination. So it's that destination um, that matters. But once again, I think we all really appreciate um, that you've taken, you know, gone to these incredible means to join us today. It's been really important. So thanks again. Thank you so much, from all of us. And, I, and have I'll a wonderful put my video birthday. Off, but I'll, I'll put my video off, but I'll be listening, okay, as I right. get to my destination. And no Thank wonder, you. No, no wonder your mother wants to talk to you. It is your birthday after all. <laughs> yes, so it's fair uh, enough. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> I'll take her call. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, our next panelist is Ono Brower, who has in fact uh, pleaded many of the cases that have been brought in the inter intervening years. So a lot of the cases or the issues that have been uh, referred to up to now. So he'll give us a perspective uh, presumably from within the, within the context of litigation and the role um, that bringing cases and the Court of Justice uh, has had to play. So, Ono, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? All right. Well, first I want to thank the organizers for having created this opportunity uh, to discuss and for inviting me to attend and participate in the discussion today. And I also want to seize the occasion to wish Helen a happy birthday. Um, I've been asked to look at the contribution of the EU courts and legal proceedings to make the right of access to documents a reality. And this means that my contribution is necessarily narrow in scope because I will as a result, discuss passive transparency, not proactive transparency. And this is a limitation because our wish is, of course, and main aim is, of course, active transparency, which avoids the need to go to court and get involved in legal proceedings. It also means that I will not discuss the role and contributions of the Ombudsman to achieve transparency, which is, however, an interesting role and quite a vast topic in its own right. But I will not discuss the, um, the practice and, 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 and great contributions of the Ombudsman uh, to transparency. I would like to make two preliminary remarks. Uh, a first remark is that I do fully recognize that some matters deserve secrecy. Not everything needs to be made public, but I do consider that secrecy is only justified if this obviously justified, as is the case for operational police or other public security information that must remain secret to combat crime. And I want to refer maybe in this regard to the suggestion which has been made 
in 2016 in a report which was drafted by Deirdre Curtin and Paivi Lano Sandberg to actually work on a secrecy act which would harmonize or bring a harmonization or, or, or consensus about what should remain secret. I, I thought that was a very interesting and, 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 and good suggestion. My second preliminary remark is that I spent quite a lot of time advising NGOs and persons not to bring cases before the EU courts. It is not because bad cases make bad law, but also because the judicial system of the EU is far from perfect. I will not divert, divert here and start a discussion on the, in my view, very imperfect, imperfect access to justice in the EU legal order, which is a topic very close to my heart, but not the topic of today. What I want to emphasize here is that the role of the court is, as you know, by nature limited when it comes to access to documents. The courts cannot order the institutions to mention documents in registers. The courts cannot order institutions or agencies to make minutes of meetings. The courts cannot take any injunctive relief vis-a-vis -vis institutions or agencies when they overclassify documents as confidential or secret. And the courts cannot impose any sanction or take any relief or rem remedy uh, or order any remedies when institutions do not respect the clear deadlines set in Regulation 1049 to reply to requests and take decisions in time. The courts cannot even intervene with an order if it appears that institutions take measures to work around the case law and adopt ways to preserve secrecy despite judgments from the Court of Justice. And Professor Jacquet has generously shared with us the example of positions of member states being removed out of minutes after the judgment in the Access Info case. And it took uh, intervention by the European Ombudsman to bring the practice back of actually noting down positions of member states. And I think it's a, it's, it's a very valid and, and interesting point. But here we see that the court is actually powerless. There's no proceeding which would allow us to then go to court and, and see that such a situation is, is a remedy. Yet, as we all know, the EU courts have played a crucial role to bring the right of access to documents alive. And in commenting on that role, I will not look back too much into the past, except for saying that it took the likes, that it took the likes of the Guardian newspaper and Heidi Hautala to bring cases to fight for the recognition of, the recognition of access to documents as a fundamental right in the EU legal order long before the transparency regulation was adopted. And at the same time, it took the political vision and energy of many others, as was recalled earlier by Sir Graham, to achieve that Regulation 1049 was adopted in 2001. There's no need to say that the next two fundamental steps where the inclusion of the right of access to documents as a fundamental right in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and in my view, the most important step, the normative choice made in Article 10 of the Lisbon Treaty to opt for both representative and participatory democracy as the political model for the EU. And I would like to pose a moment at that last point which is the explicit choice in the treaty for re participatory democracy. As I think it responds to one of the points which Professor Jacquet made earlier on, when Professor Jacquet actually mentioned that in his view, 
transparency is about transparency after the event. Now, I suggest that that has fundamentally changed with the Lisbon Treaty and with the normative choice for participatory democracy, because participatory democracy means transparency before decisions are being taken, so during the events, and that it is absolutely crucial that access to relevant information can be obtained in order to participate in decision making rather than being told after decisions have been taken how, by whom they were taken. It's actually transparency before decision making and during the events. It is against this background that one should assess in my view, where we stand today in terms of EU transparency, where the case of the EU court stands, and discuss the challenges ahead. And I think Helen Derbyshire has already mentioned quite a number of very interesting challenges. But taking stock at this point, I would like to contribute to our discussion by making two sets of observations. First, I would like to say something about the conduct of institutions when it comes to transparency. And my second set of observations concerns the need to explore new avenues and improvements in the case law of the EU courts. So my first observation is on, on the conduct of, of institutions. And this is really about the question whether the transparency regulation and the Lisbon Treaty have actually brought about a real change in the, um, in the approach to transparency and whether the institutions do indeed live up to making participatory democracy a reality. And there I must say with certain regret that it is sometimes Unfortunate, what we see or, or what appear to be the positions taken by the institutions in court proceedings. Um, just to mention an example, in the, the Capitani case, it was su suggested that trilogues were not part of the legislative process, despite the fact that more than 80% of EU legislation is indeed decided and adopted in trilogues. It was also suggested in the Capitani case that trilogue documents cannot qualify as being legislative documents because they are not attached to a formal legislative proceeding. And I think that's regretful. Um, the same applies, for instance, to the Turco case law, which Professor Jacquet also referred to. I think that it, when we look at the Turco case law, it has become, with subsequent judgments, established case law. And yet we see that in a recent case of Professor Laurent Pech seeking access to a legal opinion, the suggestion is being made that access cannot be granted for all the reasons which had been and have been explicitly rejected time and again by the Court of Justice. And I think that is, that is a, a, a regretful. Um, we have also a case like the case brought recently also by Professor Pifley Leiner Sandberg who sought access to the decision, um, to, to a, re, a formal decision under the transparency regulation to the conformity application made by Emilio de Capitani. Now, I think it's, it's quite basic that formal decisions under a regulation like the transparency regulation dealing with the request for access should be made public. And yet, 
the European Parliament decided not to, to refuse access to that decision and to go and, 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 and to, to force uh, Professor Lerner Sandberg to go to court to obtain uh, that decision. I, I think those cases are regretful and are unnecessary. So what I'm saying is we have quite a number of cases being brought, which in my view could simply have been avoided. Um, now, that brings me to um, my second set of observations, um, because I, I, I think with, with regard to these cases which were unnecessary, I'm afraid, well, it's a fact of life, it happens. Uh, but I think it tells us that there is work to be done to, to, to make the institutions work in accordance with the case law. I mean, that, 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 that I think is, is, is really necessary because it, 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 it would um, um, mean that we can avoid a lot of, of proceedings. But uh, on the other hand, there are also new situations and um, topics which I think require attention um, in the future and where we need to explore, I think, new avenues and also further improvements in the case law of the courts. And one, uh, I just want to mention a, a few areas where I think uh, there's a need for, for real um, uh, development. And the first one I want to mention is, is protection of the environment. I, I, I think it is um, maybe of interest to note that in the EU legal order, cases like we have seen at the member state level, like the Urgenda case, where actually the courts can order a government to take measures to protect the environment or measures to deal with climate change, that that type of judicial intervention is not possible at the EU level. The EU courts do not have any power to intervene, any competence to intervene in that, in that way. But what it tells us is that at the EU level, it is all the more important that there is a real possibility to access environmental information and a real need for transparency so that at least political debate can be generated, not after the event, but before the event, before decisions are being taken. So I think that I would put this as a, a very high priority to, to see how access to environmental let's just, uh, uh, information and, 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 and environment documents that deal with environmental protection do get a, a high level of access because this is very necessary for NGOs to be able to play a role in, in, in this area. I reckon I'm probably at the end of my time. So I will just briefly say that other um, 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 areas which I've noted as key areas to make further progress are um, access to documents from the courts. I think it's an interesting topic in itself. Um, then also access to documents relating to infringement proceedings, if these are pilot proceedings, pilot procedures, if these documents relate to environmental protection or climate change. And there is a link here with the Aarhus Convention. It's a topic in itself to discuss. But I do think, uh, I just want to mention this because I do think it, it is an important item in the 2016 report of uh, Deirdre Kirchen and Pfeiffer-Leiner Sandberg already identified this as a challenge ahead, that the case law does not allow any access to 
documents relating to infringement proceedings. Now, I'm not saying it should all be open, but I think there should be certain areas where more transparency and access is needed. Um, I think I will stop here. I have, I have, I have a, um, um, a further list with challenges and hat and suggestions, but I will keep that for another time or for the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Anno. I think that's great. You've brought in a number of really important issues uh, for now and for the future um, that have also been discussed over the years, particularly the, the past few years. So I think it's really good to uh, relook at those and bring them into the discussion. Um, but given the time, and I apologize, I'm, I'm apparently a very bad chair, but I think it's so interesting to hear all of you and to have this opportunity um, that um, I'm, I'm bad at cutting any of you, any of you off, and therefore also equality demands that I, that I don't just do it for one or two of you. But it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final pa panelist, Emilio De Capitani. Uh, who is not only the initiative taker for today's event, and I'm very grateful, as I'm sure we all are, uh, for his gentle and not so gentle nudging uh, for this to, to take place. I'm extremely happy that it is taking place. And uh, Emilio, as, as probably most of you know, is a, is a tireless campaigner over the years um, for transparency. And he has operated from various different places and in various guises from within the parliament, um, but also um, as a, a litigator bringing an important case to the Court of Justice, um, which has already been referred to, and now as founder and director of an NGO, um, the Free Group. Emilio, you have the word. And after that, just for, there will be time for discussion and questions um, to the panel. Um, so, Emilio, you have the word. Uh, thanks, Deirdre. Uh, I will be very um, quick in my presentation because uh, almost everything has uh, already been said. Um, but let me remind that three years have now passed since uh, the case as my name, but tri trilogues still remain a sort of uh, Bermuda Triangle, because uh, there is no uh, clear calendar, there is no uh, publication of the multi-columns document, and uh, you have always to ask uh, for uh, having these documents, and maybe if, if you ask it, this document to the parliament, you will have access to them only uh, one month or even later. So um, this is unfortunate, but it shows that uh, the institution are not very willing to uh, implement what the Court of Justice has uh, uh, stated in this ruling and in previous rulings. Um, in fact, I think that uh, the, the, after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, what the European institution should do should be to give to the legislative function the priority and the relevance, which is uh, essential in the European Union, which is grounded on the rule of law. And uh, for this reason, uh, there are several initiatives that can be taken. And uh, as far as I know, is, uh, uh, are, are not yet taken, even if the Commission is presenting again and again uh, its uh, uh, communication on the better lawmaking. But uh, matter, uh, making legislation now is unfortunately uh, not very uh, transparent and clear. But again, let me come back on the issue of trilogues. Trilogues uh, started with the Regulation 1049, and also with Regulation uh, 45 2001 on protection of personal data. And the Parliament was very willing to have a, a, a direct dialogue with the other institution because it was and still is interested in the efficiency of the decision making process. So uh, the point was to try to have an agreement as soon as possible. 
The point is that you have to be uh, efficient, but also transparent. Why efficiency should be um, against uh, transparency? Uh, quite often being transparent is also uh, a way to uh, find the right arguments and not just to uh, blackmail each other on, on some uh, particular uh, points. But I will not uh, make reference to some cases I had the chance to follow. So, um, there is behind this idea of informality something which is extremely interesting for the diplomats, but is not exactly what you can uh, expect from a legislative function. Um, so probably uh, we should uh, limit uh, the informal, uh, the informality and uh, respecting some basic principles of uh, transparency. Uh, the Council has just started recently with the Eurogroup uh, meetings to have access, uh, some, some rules who are uh, close to the access to document regulation. Why not to do the same also for the informal meetings of the Council or even of the European Council? Because when you present this meeting as informal and you discuss a legislative strategy. In fact, you are prejudging what will be uh, decided when the formal procedure will start. So I think that um, we should also overcome the artificial distinction between strategies and legislation. Uh, and very often this is presented as strategy was uh, more important than legislation. Legislation is on, was only just the mise en musique uh, of decision that politically has have been taken by institutions which, according to the treaty, have no legislative power. So let's maybe reorganize the priority according to the vision of the treaty, uh, and uh, notably after Lisbon. Also, for another aspect, when the treaty says that uh, the Council and the Parliament should meet in public when considering legislation, uh, this is something which make uh, the protection of the decision making process uh, in a certain way a sort of comma 22. How can you protect the decision making process uh, without uh, um, or, or by um, being also uh, transparent. So um, probably you should uh, give more uh, space to the uh, freedom of uh, access and to the transparency of debates. Uh, notably because now most of the agreements are already taken during the parliamentary phase and the parliament in, in fact is an institution who should be transparent, not only when it acts alone, but also when it, it is with the other institutions. Uh, moreover, I think that you, you Derdre, was, were very right with the, uh, when years ago, you asked for a legal framework for classifying and declassifying documents. Because even today, the only reference that we have in, in, the, in the secondary law is Article 9 of Regulation 1049, which makes just reference to this category of documents, but not develop the concept. And this can also create some very disturbing evolution. Take the case of the European Union agreements with third countries on exchanging confidential information. All these agreements have an article where it's clearly stated that the European Union for the agreement in discussion is only represented by the Council, by the Commission and the External Action Service. So the parliament does not exist, the court of justice does not exist. And this is create a sort of a gray area, which can be very worrying. Again, in European Union, we claim to be ruled by the rule of law. 
Um, moreover, I am totally in favor of the proposal of Ellen Derbyshire to make more transparency on the implementation of a EU law and national level. We all know that Article 15 of the, of the treaty uh, on access to document is not a legal base for harmonizing, uh, harmonization of national legislation. But it remains that when member states implement EU law, they are uh, working in the EU framework. Moreover, a national legislation implementing a directive, in fact, is a sort of a com by completing a process who started in Brussels, but will end up in, in the national capitals. And the, moreover, is the most important phase because it is at the moment when national legislation is adopted that in fact the citizens know uh, if they have a right or obligation. Last but not least, uh, Jean-Paul was referring to the fact that uh, the commission wanted to protect its own relations with the member state. This is very interesting, important, but this could not be at the expenses of the transparency on the national implementation phase. And I think that probably we should uh, foresee um, a, a formula, an article in the EU legislation, which requires that when implementing EU law, member states should uh, um, respect the same level of transparency who is binding when they decide in Brussels. Last but not least, I think that uh, most of the reasons why uh, the Commission and the Council are not particularly in favor of transparency is because we don't, we don't have um, yet today uh, clear rules on uh, administrative transparency. We have not yet um, something clear, even if Article 15 of Regulation 1049 ask the European institutions, agencies and bodies to uh, organize themselves according to the principle of transparency. And now in Article 298 of the treaty and 41 of the charter, you have this important principle of good administration. Obviously, uh, uh, if you are not transparent, you can create, create the suspicion that maybe you are not following the principle of good administration. And this is something that maybe can be solved by following the request of the European Parliament to establish a new uh, EU legislation on good administration. So these were my suggestions. Thank you so much, Emilio, for these very succinct and, and relevant observations. Uh, very important. Um, in the interest of time, um, I would invite the attendees also, if they want to put on their videos now, those of you who haven't, there are quite a number of researchers were also uh, joined and it's also partially been set up by the working group um, on the digital public sphere here at the EUI and there are a number of attendees from that and also other um, researchers and people from over across the uh, EUI. Um, so anybody who would like to ask, make an observation or ask a question, please, could you raise your digital hand? Um, there is a uh, at the bottom of the screen, there is a place that you can raise your hand and otherwise let me know. Um, would anyone like to make an observation or ask a question? This is now your opportunity also with great um, panelists. Okay, I see Adrian Rubio first. I would ask you, yeah, if you if you ask a question to turn on your video. Uh, Adrian, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor Curtin, and thank you very much, all the, the panelists. This has been really insightful. I was wondering, actually following De Capitani's um, uh, comments, how the relationship, how do you envisage a little bit the relationship between Article 41 
and Article 42, meaning uh, the right to good administration and the right to access, and how one and the development, both at, at the judicial but also at the legislative level, can in influence one another. In other words, should we put the, the focus on making good administration the tool to achieve more transparency, or should you pay attention to the development of the right to access documents to enlighten the future development of good administration? And particularly while talking about transparency, not only after exposed the decision has, uh, once the decision has been made, if we are paying attention to active participation and trying to pay attention to those um, prerogatives that citizens okay. at the EU level have to uh, affect the decision-making process throughout the process in the decision-making itself, what role do you think that the motivation and the duty to give reasons could play in this, in this interplay of transparency, accountability during the decision-making process? Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you, Adrian, uh, for that question to Emilio. What I'm going to do now is also in the interest of time, I'm going to gather uh, questions and then we'll have one final round. So I first of all give priority to those of you who are attending and have been listening um, and then to the panel themselves if they want to come back on, on anything. But first the attendees. Uh, you can also just raise your hand like this if uh, it's not working digitally. Um, so would anyone like to come in with an observation or a suggestion? Yes, um, Martin Hillebrand, who's joining us from Finland, I believe, Helsinki. Yeah. Hi, um, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot to uh, all the speakers for the, the very interesting uh, presentations and also recaps of uh, the inception of Regulation 1049. Um, my question um, um, goes a bit in, in the direction of sort of the technological development um, that, uh, and, and also actually sort of the, the societal um, uh, current uh, that, that go along with that, um, that has developed over the, over the past 20 years. Um, I think we can all safely say that Regulation 1049 was uh, conceived at the time that uh, sort of the style of, of public debate, uh, of, um, political conduct and so on, um, and of course technological um, uh, possibilities on social media and, and communication, direct communication for politicians and so on were not really um, foreseen uh, and certainly uh, do not find a place in uh, the legislation itself. Um, um, and, and so I, I find the observation of uh, Professor Jacquet quite interesting that uh, when we're talking about making the EU really transparent, maybe access to documents, uh, you know, can only get us th this far. Um, and not further. So my question would be, um, so what, what does that sort of uh, tell us about maybe the relevance of access to documents um, uh, going forward? And also, what is the relation between the access to documents instrument uh, and other sort of questions of, of communication, um, uh, transparency, and perhaps also the, the spread of false information? Is there, are these separate, separated issues in your opinion or um, um, are these issues that actually also legislatively might be coupled? Yeah, I have no, no particular um, uh, respondent or speaker in mind. Okay. So whoever feels uh, they would All like right. to answer the question. Thanks, Martin. That's a great question. Very relevant. Uh, Louisa, I see that you also want to come in, so that's fine. What I'm going to do then is in reverse order, I will give the, the floor to each member of the panel, and then if some, then you can respond to the questions as, as you wish, and any other observations you want to make on the, the panels. Louisa is joining us from Milan, I believe. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, all the interesting presentation that I've uh, uh, that I've heard and that uh, brought us a bit uh, back in time to times where indeed uh, integration was progressing and we've heard that one of the key words was opportunity that we've heard at the beginning and nowadays a bit the, the key word seems to be a uh, crisis but I have a question concerning strategic litigation and uh, because I, indeed, I think that um, I've been reflecting upon this uh, recently and for example in the case of migration um, one of the examples which is made is that sometimes strategic litigation can be also counterproductive. For example, 
in the case of uh, migration after the hearsay judgment against Italy uh, that have been uh, scrutinized in pushback policies conducted by a state, there has been even a further, uh, um, to say, step in the bad direction in the sense of further externalization. So I was indeed wondering whether um, uh, yeah, non-legal uh, development uh, could play uh, a role also in the context of deciding how to tackle uh, a given problem. And perhaps this is a question for, for Ono Brauer, perhaps. And, and uh, another remark um, that I have is that um, uh, sometimes I think in the case, for example, of migration, the external dimension of migration, there is very much uh, deference, uh, I think, from the Court of Justice, uh, also for the from the General Court to uh, step in and set um, a progressive agenda, or not even a progressive agenda, but really like a coherent agenda, an agenda which is coherent to earlier adjudication. For example, I think at the EU Turkey, uh, agreement of the general court, uh, without going into details, uh, I think that the question is, the answer for that is that in some cases, the European courts cannot really give orders to government. And, and, and that's, uh, yeah, mutatis mutandi is something which has been said here. So I think, and here the problem is that there is a, a long-standing crisis in politics in the context of asylum and migration. So here the question is, but I don't know to whom address this question, is when, court, um, uh, when courts cannot do much because there is a long-standing crisis of politics uh, underlying it, uh, yeah, what to do? I mean, if courts are not the answer, then uh, where, how to unblock the situation in some, some way? I don't know if this second question is clear. Thanks, Louisa. I think that also gives uh, an idea of the kind of uh, things uh, that we are grappling with also nowadays. Uh, Sarah, you have uh, raised your hand. And I think um, if nobody else wants to raise their hand, I, I, they can do it now. But otherwise, um, we'll cut it off here. So I think and then go back to the panel. Um, it's okay, fine. So I'm I'm stopping the the list here now um, with the, with the last two um, speakers. So Sarah, you now have the floor. Perfect. I'll make it very short. I know we are quite uh, <laughs> limited yeah. in time, but I my fault. Want to, yeah, no, no. I mean, it was it was a great <laughs> event. I was very happy to listen to all of the speakers. So I think you did a great time management, Deirdre. No worries. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> I just had more or less a general question more on the transparency of the courts and uh, the judgments in a way, because I know that personal opinions of judges are supposed to be a uh, secret and we're not supposed to know the opinions of them. But I was kind of wondering, since uh, for the European Court of Human Rights, they tend to publish separate opinions, whether dissenting and concurring, what the opinions of the panelists would be uh, of an idea of potentially bringing that to the Court of Justice as well. Because I think for academics, particularly, it's very interesting for us, even though, I mean, we might agree with the, the decision, it's always nice to see what a potential other reasoning would be. And yeah, just basically have the opinion that you would have on that, whether that could be a good opinion, a good idea, because it could contribute very well to uh, having more transparency in the EU and in particularly the Court of Justice. Great, thank you, uh, Sarah. And now Ezio Perillo has has the the last word in any event from the attendees. And um, Ezio knows the institutions and the history well, both from within the European Parliament and within the court. No, no, but that's also a special position. So Ezio, you have the floor. Thanks, thanks, Deja. Just few words. Uh, um, uh, some some of the participants knows that that um, Emilio and myself, we have been um, in many respects, the naughty boys in the, in the European Parliament, uh, not only for transparency, but also for other um, important issues. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, uh, no, let me, let me say, uh, first of all, how pleased I am to meet again with, with uh, Graham, 
nowadays Sir Graham, but in my days was Graham and, <laughs> and Michael, uh, uh, because uh, uh, it was many, many years ago, we, we, we used to work together and, uh, and now is really, really for me a great moment to see you both again. With, with Jean with Jean Paul, uh, we had the pleasure of uh, see each other every now every now and then in Venice. So uh, it's it's quite it's quite different, but uh, uh, good to see uh, also uh, Jean Paul. And and then uh, what what I could say on this great uh, meeting we 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 had uh, so far. Uh, I think that uh, I would focus only on, on legislative uh, acts uh, because that uh, was not exactly the major point in the, in the regulation uh, 1049. Uh, the, the regulation was dealing with uh, documents, institution documents, and there are only two, uh, two, uh, right, uh, two provisions in the, in the regulation uh, um, which mention uh, legislative uh, documents. Nowadays, I believe that uh, transparency in legislative uh, function does not depend on regulation 1049, but it can stand on its own because of the provision of the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, uh, one has been mentioned by, by uh, Michael is the new paragraph one of article 15, which says that in order to promote good governance, well, that is a general obligation, but then paragraph two goes on is saying the European parliament shall meet in public and shall the council when considering and voting on a draft legislative act. That is, in my view, a direct effect provision which establish a precise, a specific obligation on the two uh, institution, which according to article 14 and 15 of the Treaty of the European Union exercise jointly the legislative function. Legislative function is a new legal concept introduced by the Lisbon Treaty. And these are an autonomous legal uh, concept which belongs only to the uh, legal order of the European Union. So I do understand when Jean-Paul says that, well, of course, in the Council, uh, uh, there are member states uh, and, and, and the need to preserve their, their margin of maneuver, let's say, and other things. But let me say that from the European point of view, in the function, in the legislative function of the Council, there is no place for sovereignty. Governments do not enter in the European function as sovereign entities. No, they are as Article 10 of the Treaty of the European Union says, they, the governments of, in the Council are accountable to the citizens and not only to their citizens, but also to the European citizens. So paradoxically, after the Lisbon Treaty and thanks to the uh, European Court of uh, European Courts, sorry, <laughs> case law, now we could, uh, say that transparency in the in the uh, European legislative function can be organized with the help of regulation 1049, but I would say simply because it's a legislative function. And just recall, let me recall the one of the conclusion of the Capitani judgments. Uh, which has not been challenged before the Court of Justice, the, the General Court says the principle of publicity and transparency are therefore inherent to the EU legislative process. And we can't help without those principles. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Kash. Thanks, Michael. Thanks.
to, to thank you Ezio thank you for bringing that in it's a very very relevant point and and takes us right back um look we don't have we don't have much time so I'm going to ask the panelists to be very brief there are only four of you left Helen has understandably uh, left us at this point uh, and we hope that she's having nice celebrations so um, Emilio you'll be first but I would ask you to um, to be brief I know you have a specific question and then I would invite the panelists you just respond to what you wish to what you picked up from um, I think that works best. Emilio. Uh, just to reply uh, to Rubio, uh, when the article 298 of the treaty says that the European new institution should have an open, independent and efficient administration, it established the bridge between transparency and uh, uh, public administration. And uh, obviously, uh, the more you are transparent also at an administrative level, more you can also give the possibility to the citizens to take part to the decision making process, as it is the case in uh, Arus Convention, and also going to the Court of Justice or the before a national judge, which seems to me closing the political circle between citizens, institutions, and good cooperation. Great, thank you very much, Emilio. Ono, now you have the floor. Uh, very uh, briefly, I think that um, with regard to the um, uh, access to environmental documents or documents which are important for the protection of the environment, um, the one comment I want to make is that I think that uh, more can be done with the public overriding interest in the case law. When we look at the case of the courts, never a case has been won uh, um, invoking or accepting a, a public overriding interest as such. And I think that the in, in the area of access to environmental information, I think that is a way for the court to get to a deeper and more transparency when it comes to protection of the environment actually saying that there is a public overriding interest in giving access to certain documents that are relevant in that context. Responding to the question of Laura, which I found very interesting about the EU-Turkey deal, I think it just tells us uh, that international relations is a difficult exception. Uh, uh, transparency in that field is a, a, a challenge. And um, I, I think you... Um, why the uh, access to documents case re relating to the EU-Turkey deal was of interest is to actually find out that despite press releases of heads of state of member states to the contrary, it appeared that the EU had actually entered into an agreement with Turkey that it was the member states who had uh, made an arrangement with Turkey. And uh, it's, it's still in debate whether that arrangement qualifies or could qualify as a treaty or not. But I think that on, in the area of international relations, I think there's a lot of work to be done and it's quite clear that international treaties can actually make uh, EU legislation almost redundant. So I think there is a need for more transparency in that area. So that's clearly on the to-do list. With regard to the question of Sarah about dissenting opinions and transparency of the EU courts, I think it, it, it seems quite clear that if judges are appointed for only a certain time, uh, when, 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 when mandates are, are only for six years, it would not be a, a good thing to introduce dissenting opinions. So I, I think it, it doesn't fit the model of the EU courts. When I have mentioned uh, transparency of the EU courts as, as an item, it's also not to suggest that there should be access to uh, the, the, the written pleadings of, 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 of parties um, during uh, the proceedings and proceedings are still pending. Uh, I, I think the case law is clear and, and, and says, no, we do not do that. But I do think there are other ways to bring the, the, the judicial activity of the EU courts closer to the citizen, which is for instance, by uh, providing for an audio file of pleadings immediately after pleadings have been held. 
uh, it's very difficult to understand why the Supreme Court of the UK can have video streaming of pleadings, why the court in Strasbourg can have video streaming of pleadings, why many other courts have access to uh, have video streams of pleadings. So one can see what positions parties are taken, taking in uh, an oral hearing. And I think uh, the minimum the EU court should do is provide an audio file, make an audio file immediately available uh, after uh, pleadings have been held in Luxembourg so that everybody can become aware of the positions taken by EU institutions and parties in those pleadings. Martin Hillebrand right. had a very interesting question, but I must apply my mind to it because I think I find it a very complex question. So a very good one, but I hope that others will give you an answer. I would have to think about it. Okay, thanks very much, Ono. Well, I think Martin's question might be the subject of possibly even several PhD uh, uh, theses. Uh, there's certainly some people working on similar issues um, here. But I, so unfortunately we have limited time uh, this evening. So. Michael, you now have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be extremely brief and say it's really good to see all of my wonderful colleagues. And it's a reminder for me that 1049 was the beginning. And you only achieve brilliant beginnings by working with people. I would say to Martin, in terms of new technology, uh, the recast adopted in 2011 foresaw this, uh, calling for a common portal on access to documents and recognizing that over time, not only documents and their status changes, but how we engage in the process. Thank you all. Um, I think I've lost my order because in fact, um, Jean-Paul, you were next. Um, I think I was confused by the fact that Helen wasn't there. So apologies, Jean-Paul, if there's anything you would like to... Um, <laughs> Okay, no, no problem. First, I, I agree with Ono about the Court of Justice and the independence of the member of the Court of Justice. If the mandate was not renewable, I can I think that we can have dissenting opinion. But now, due to the necessity of independence from member state, I think it's not possible. And just for ASIO, uh, I agree with you. In my opinion, all the legislative process in the Council has to be made public. It means Corepa and working group. But uh, I don't think that you can achieve this aim only by regulation, because it's a question of mentality, of behavior of the member. And even if you, if you oblige them to help public debate, it will be fake public debate. And all will be uh, regular behind the scene. So we have a problem then. And con concluding, we have a huge problem, I agree, of uh, participation of the public. And I will suggest that there is a lot of consultation uh, by the Commission, and I try to answer to some of the, this consultation. And it's clearly impossible. It is a question I written in, in a bureaucratic way, and you cannot always understand what problem is at stake. So please, for the Commission, make your consultation in plain language, explain the objective, <laughs> and so on. Otherwise, it's only a job. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting meeting. Thank you very much, Professor Jacquet. That's a, a wonderful point about the understandability um, as well of language and of the purpose, um, and the purpose of why things are being done and seeking contact with the public. So now, Sir Graham, uh, you have the last word. Well, uh, thank you, Deirdre. Um, again, I think everything that needs to be said has been said. But if I can draw just three lessons from 
what has happened over these 20 years. The first is the wisdom of H.G. Wells' remark that human history becomes increasingly a race between education and catastrophe. Ono Brower made the point of how important it is that on things like environmental protection, we can get the information we need. The second lesson I would draw is that we shouldn't be too pessimistic because European integration is a bit like water flowing downhill. You know, sometimes it detours. Occasionally you can dam it for a while. Occasionally it goes underground, but it always finds a way down. And I think that integration always finds a way forward. And so my final point is that looking back at that period, those 18 months in which we did this, you know, it's always national interests which set the stage, but it's human emotions which determine the script. And what we did at that time was we brought together the right emotions and the right people. And if we can do that again, then I'm sure we can make progress in a final success in recasting the 1049 regulation. Well, thank you for those. No, nobody could have said it um, better um, and in a more positive and, and forward-looking fashion. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful. And also to giving us hope um, in the sense that um, it's about also bringing together um, human emotions and, and working together and um, exploring what the very, I mean, quite a number of things have been put on the table um, this evening, and I'm certainly not going to summarize them at this uh, late stage, but I think it has been very useful to both look back at, with the purpose of assessing where we are now and in order to move forward. So thank you all very warmly for giving up two hours of your time on what for some of you was a public bank holiday or, and, or your birthday in Helen's case. I'm extremely grateful. It just shows the um, commitment. I'm also very grateful to Angelica Lafranchi, who is behind the Robert Schumann Center uh, flag as it were, but who has enabled and facilitated um, this whole event. And I think this shows also the positive way that um, Zoom can work, these kind of Zoom events that you know you see people that you normally would not necessarily have have been able to to bring together. There's Angelica. So thank you, Angelica. Thank all of you very very much. And uh, until we meet again, hopefully maybe on a sunny day in Florence. Today is not sunny in Florence, I might add. <laughs> it's raining, but um, hopefully that will be possible in the not too distant future. So thank you and um, uh, good evening to everybody. Bye-bye.